Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Welcome back to Dark Poutine. I am Mike Brown here in the Dark Poutine studio in Langley, British Columbia. And this is Matthew. Mike, welcome back from Alberta. Yes, I I had a great time in Alberta. We, we can't really talk about the project much because it's coming out next year. How is Morgan? Morgan is great. And uh, the guy who we went out with, Jason Hewlett, he's pretty fantastic. Interestingly... We had a bit of a realization when we were out uh, filming. But you're cousins. No, we're not oh, cousins. Okay. But uh, I, I kept thinking, where do I know this guy from? And he was thinking the same thing. He and I went to film school together. He was in the fo- foundation film program and I was in the acting program. He directed me in a short film. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are trying to remember how you know each other. Yeah, 30 years ago. That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was pretty crazy. That is crazy. The name of the movie was Truth Is. And uh, yeah, I played a uh, a guy who was uh, a kidnapper and, and you know, uh, oh, people like, trafficker and all. Yeah. I would like to see that movie. Uh, nobody is ever going to see that. Because <laughs> it's poo. <laughs> anyway. Mike's Mike's early work. Oh yeah, I don't know about work. I just <laughs> felt like, oh my god, I. And the part that Michael Brown will be playing is played by a piece of wood. <laughs> anyway, the views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Patine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate, Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Listener discretion is strongly advised. We're not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We're two ordinary Canadians chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. You are responsible for obtaining and maintaining at your own cost all equipment needed to listen to dark poutine. Dark poutine can be addictive. Side effects may include, but not be limited to, pausing and questioning the system, elevated heart rate, pondering humanity, odd looks from colleagues as you laugh out loud at work, family members not into true crime worrying about you. Positive side effects may include some perspectives and opinions that you disagree with, as well as some wokeness and empathy. If you don't think dark poutine is for you, consult your doctor immediately. In July 1991, the city of Vancouver was rocked by the brutal murder of 29-year-old Mary Lynn Kimberly Breeden. Friends and family called her Lynn. The charred remains of her body were discovered in a dumpster with bullet wounds to the skull. What followed was a complex investigation that would uncover a web of deceit, greed, and cold-blooded violence. Through witness accounts, advances in forensic evidence, and detailed police work, Detectives were able to piece together the chilling details of Breeden's final moments. Their investigation led them to a suspect named Christian Albert Cruz, a male stripper with a history of violence. As the case unfolded, a tragic tale of betrayal and desperation began to emerge, shedding light on the dark motivations that drove one man to commit such a heinous act. You're listening to Dark Poutine episode 320, All That Remains, The Murder of Mary Lynn Breeden. In the late afternoon of July 6, 1991, while disposing of the trash, two janitors, one named Milton Diaz 
made a troubling discovery in a garbage dumpster on the 1500 block of Rand Avenue, directly across from the Fraser Arms Hotel on Marine Drive in South Vancouver. When they approached the dumpster, the pair noted that the sides of it felt unusually warm, even for a summer day. Upon looking inside, to the right-hand side of the dumpster, Diaz saw a charred and blackened figure, shaped like a person. It appeared small, burned so badly that it appeared to be a child at first glance. Diaz dropped the garbage bags he was carrying and ran to call for the police. Later interviewed for an episode of the true crime docuseries Forensic Files called Charred Remains, Diaz, whose first language was Spanish, said of his gruesome discovery, quote, I know something was burned, but what was it? Was it animal or was it a person? If it was a person, it was too terrible to happen. It was too out of, you know, what I can conceive that someone will do to another human being, end quote. We have linked to the episode in our show notes, but be forewarned, if you have any intent to watch, I can't recall a more gory episode of this show. It is horrendous. And there have been many, many gory episodes of Forensic Files. Yeah, I wouldn't want to see it. And what uh, what he says here really hits me. This He said, talks about it, it's too terrible to happen, and he can't conceive of someone doing it to another human being. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, no matter how many shows we do, Mike, or how much I know about history, <laughs> right, I still can't conceive people doing this to each other. Even but though they, we know it happens, I can't conceive it. It's just so weird. I can conceive it now because I've read so much, yeah. you know. I can't conceive doing it personally to anybody. That's the thing. But you 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 yeah, you know people do it. Police responded and found a shocking crime scene and cordoned off the area to preserve evidence while they delicately extracted the body from the dumpster. The body was in a terrible state, unidentifiable by sight, and weighed only 36 pounds or just over 16 kilograms. The investigators knew immediately that identifying the victim through traditional means like fingerprints would be impossible given the severely burned state of the body. During the autopsy, Dr. Gray couldn't find any recognizable skin, but did discover a small patch of what appeared to be reddish-blonde hair where the victim's head had pressed against the floor of the dumpster. However, the intense heat had destroyed the hair follicles, rendering DNA testing impossible. X-rays of the skull revealed several pieces of metal and a fractured skull, evidence of gunshot wounds. Bullet fragments removed from the brain came from a twenty two caliber weapon, but were too badly damaged for ballistic identification. This confirmed for the investigators that they were dealing with a homicide case. The gunshots had caused more severe damage to the brain and fractured many facial bones. Blood found in the facial bones and sinus cavities indicated active circulation when the bullets entered, meaning the victim's heart was still beating at the time the shots were fired. Unfortunately, the intense heat altered the body chemistry, preventing DNA analysis. Fire and elevated temperatures during burning can degrade and damage DNA in biological materials like body tissues and blood. A 2019 medical study titled Effect of Fire on DNA and its Profiling in Homicide Cases found that DNA profiling was possible from samples not directly exposed to heat slash fire, but samples in direct contact with fire had degraded DNA. Wildfires, like recent ones in Maui, can reach temperatures of over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 1,093 degrees Celsius. Hot enough to destroy even tooth enamel, the hardest substance in the human body. While earlier studies suggest DNA is destroyed above 1,850 degrees Fahrenheit, or 1,010 degrees Celsius, a recent study found that most DNA samples could survive such extreme heat. Bone can help preserve DNA to some extent. You know, I was wondering if more bodies are burned now than before when there's been a murder and before DNA um, mm. as a way to get rid of evidence. I, I love these like macroeconomic things of 
sure. of, of murder, right? Yeah. Like, hey, you know, like there's less serial killers now because there's more evidence. So people are moving into mass murder, stuff like that. Yeah. And I couldn't really, f- I couldn't find any numbers, but I did bump into an interesting article in the American newspaper, the Augusta Chronicle. I guess that maybe be Georgia, maybe. Yeah. I'm not sure. So, um, and it said, quote, burning is often seen as a way to destroy evidence or dispose of a body, but authorities say it's that's just a myth. In the past, successfully covering up a crime with fire was feasible, but with today's advances in technology, evidence can always be found. Uh, and then there's a quote, uh, it might take us a little longer because you have to sift through the fire damage, but we still overcome it, said Richmond County Sheriff's Lieutenant Calvin Chu. The difficulty is ultimately determined by how quickly the fire is extinguished. Fire, yeah, fire, Chu said, is no more damaging to evidence in homicide cases than water or other elements, end quote. Yeah, so I just, I just kind of looking into just this case got me wondering if more and more people after the invention or the, the not the invention of DNA, but you know what I mean, of t- techniques. Discovery of DNA yeah, technology. If, yeah. if, if, if people started thinking, uh, well, let's do this, right? But mm-hmm. I, I couldn't find it. Yeah. But yeah, and I think that's important that that uh that note about how quickly it's extinguished, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. If it's if it's allowed to burn for an extended period, that this might be a different story. Yeah. And especially because we're talking about technology that was available to the prosecution uh and investigators in uh the 1990s. Yeah. So, yeah. Examination of the body's lungs showed no sign of smoke inhalation, suggesting the victim was already deceased before the fire. Thank goodness. The state of the internal organs revealed the victim was an adult female. Despite the gruesome condition of the remains, the investigators were determined to identify the victim and bring the perpetrator to justice through meticulous examination of every available shred of evidence. To assist with the identification process, Investigators brought in Dr. Larry Cheevers, a forensic odontologist tasked with studying the victim's dental remains. The use of dental records to identify victims of crime and violence has a long history, dating back to ancient times. One of the earliest well-documented cases is from 66 AD, when the Roman Empress Agrippina had her rival, Lalia Paulina, murdered. When Paulina's severed head was brought to Agrippina, she was unable to recognize the distorted features. However, Agrippina could identify Paulina by examining her distinctive teeth, some of which had been partially replaced with gold. This is the first recorded instance of using dental identification to identify a body. Another early example comes from 1193 A.D., in India, where the Raja of Kanauji, Jai Chand, was murdered by Muhammad's army. Jai Chand was identified by his false teeth, making this the first recorded case of forensic identification in India. In 1758, during the French and Indian Wars, Peter Halkett was killed in battle near Fort Duquesne, and Halkett's son identified his father's skeleton by way of an artificial tooth that had been made for him. Using dental records for identification continued into the American Revolutionary War. In 1776, Dr. Joseph Warren was killed at the Battle of Bunker Hill. Although his face was unrecognizable due to a fatal head wound, he was identified by the small denture that had been made for him by dentist Paul Revere. Yes, that Paul Revere. These early examples from ancient Rome, medieval India, and 18th century America demonstrate how dental records and prosthetics were used to identify victims of violence and war, establishing forensic odontology as an essential tool in criminal investigations. I had no idea Paul Revere was a dentist. (laughs) Me neither. (laughs) Me neither until I did this amount of research. But he definitely was. It's pretty pretty fascinating he's he's the one that told the americans that we were coming 
That's with, right. Yeah. The British are coming. Yeah. Oh, that we were coming. Well, it was, it was us, right? Yeah, sure. Like, I was joking with Mike before we started recording. I'm like, the traitor. He's like, no, our American friends will get upset. I'm like, they won't care. They won. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you know? fair enough. If you, if, you, abs- if you win, you're not allowed to get upset. And, and at this point <laughs> in time, I'm starting to think taxation without representation is the case in Canada as well. <laughs> I don't feel represented. <laughs> oh, gosh. Anyway, that's a whole different podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Dark Poutine uh, talks about politics. No, thanks. Paul Revere was, I, I started, when I read that in the script, I started reading. I'm like, he was a fascinating dude, actually. Yeah. He really was. He did yeah, so much. It's, how do people shove that much into their lives? I don't know. It's like Benj- Benjamin Franklin's the same way. He's like, what? He did what? Yeah. <laughs> He's such an interesting cat. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm like watching reruns of Absolutely Fabulous on TV, right? Yeah. Me, it's Little House on the Prairie. <laughs> <laughs> Despite the victim in this case being subjected to an intense inferno that left virtually nothing behind... Dr. Cheevers was surprised to find that the jawbone and teeth were intact beneath the charred surface. In gory detail, in the Forensic Files episode on the case, Cheevers explained that teeth often survive even the most severe fires because they are surrounded by protective barriers like saliva in the mouth. The gases in the stomach expand, pushing the tongue out, while the outer facial muscles become leathery, all of which help preserve the teeth. Through studying the growth patterns of the teeth and skull, Dr. Cheevers estimated the victim's age to be between 24 and 30. More importantly, when examining the x-rays closely, he discovered the victim had an extremely rare dental condition called mesiodens, an extra tooth that never grew into place on top of the two front teeth inside the gum line. The x-rays also showed extensive, high-quality dental work. With this newfound evidence, investigators had a better chance of identifying the victim, though they still lacked any leads on potential suspects at that point. Police told Greg Middleton, a reporter covering the case, that they thought solving it would be near impossible given how little they had to go on initially. However, when reviewing recent missing persons reports, One case caught their attention, that of 30-year-old Lynn Breeden, with blonde hair, was last seen the day before the charred remains were discovered. Upon comparing her dental records with those from the remains, the extra mesiodens tooth and matching dental work left Dr. Cheevers convinced beyond doubt that the victim was Lynn Breeden. According to an article by the Vancouver Sun's Neil Hall, Mary Lynn Kimberly Breeden was born in Portage La Prairie, Manitoba in 1960. Lynn's family moved frequently due to her father's career as a Royal Canadian Air Force pilot. They lived in various places including Quebec, Germany, Ottawa, and finally Comox. Her brother, John Breeden, described her as a warm and gentle and sensitive person, generous, vivacious, and quick to laugh. Lynn loved to read, enjoyed the sun, and was known for her lively spirit and generosity. Lynn moved to Vancouver in 1979 and attended Langara College for a year, initially considering a teaching career. However, she found waitressing more rewarding and eventually made more money than her sister-in-law, Helen Sawchuck, an accountant. Her roommate, Rob Lamaru, praised her skills, believing she might have been Vancouver's best waitress at the time. Lamaru added that she loved her work and family, including her mother, father, and three brothers. Lynn was the second eldest. She was a very precious person, said Vivian Becker, a friend who worked at Richards on Richards, who noted she was always looking out for her to come up the stairs at Richards. Lynn Breeden had a vibrant social life, making many friends during her ten years in the hospitality industry. She touched a lot of people's lives, John, her brother, said. She made one mistake— and it cost her her life, end quote. She was also searching for Mr. Wright, hoping to settle down, have children, and possibly switch her career to hotel or restaurant management. Quote, she wanted someone who was intelligent, kind, generous, and successful, sister-in-law Helen Sawchuck said. If this tragedy hadn't happened, she would have had it all. 
end quote. Lynn loved animals and owned a fluffy Persian cat named Chi-Chi, whom she had trained to fetch money. <laughs> That's a good idea. I should train my <laughs> boys to do that. She also had spent six months in New Zealand working as a silver service waitress at a top-notch resort serving the final, finest clientele. Lynn had also won the Miss Hawaii pageant and had modeled for the BC Lions and Big O Tire <laughs> for a poster. Oh, fun. Big O. That's cool. Uh, yeah. yeah. Actually, it's it's interesting. She she did proper proper waitering service. So mm-hmm. it's a real profession. So Totally. The really high-end places do a great job in training people. And I can remember speaking to somebody well over a decade ago who at that time was making like 100,000 British pounds a year as a waiter. Mm-hmm. Right? Like... That's good dosh, you know? Yeah. I've only ever had service like that one time. I was given uh, the seats of the CEO of the telecom that I used to work for, for a Canucks game. Okay. And they are in level 500, which is like the cream of the crop. You have your own seat, a uh, set of seats. You have your own little table, and you have a person there who will wait on you hand and foot. And not- you do- and you don't even know they're there. Right. Yeah, so, they, do, they don't involve themselves unless you want them. Having spent most of my adult life in Europe, mm-hmm. and a lot of that time in business trips around the world with very nice restaurants, um, when I came to Vancouver, Justin and I found the service really shocking. Yeah. <laughs> so when, when, you know, there's the whole, I don't know if they, hey, American friends, tell us if they do this in America. You start eating and the waiter comes up, how are your first few bites? It's like my mouth is full. Justin, um, you know, <laughs> Justin started saying interrupted when they <laughs> say <laughs> Good. Do they do that in America as well? How are I your think, first I'm few bites? Sure they do. Ah, shut up. Anyway, <laughs> it's a hard job though. Serving is a hard job. I, yeah, I, I did it. I did it through college. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Lynn loved to travel to sunny destinations, visiting Mexico earlier in the year and returning from Palm Springs a week before her death. She also enjoyed Whistler, where she worked at Buffalo Bill's nightclub and had many friends. Brian Walker, a friend from Whistler, recalled, quote, She loved oysters on the half shell by the dozen. She was always honest, whether or not it was what you wanted to hear, end quote. Lynn's brother John emphasized that Lynn was a respectable girl, not loose, and she was cautious about the men who approached her in bars, always taking taxis home. Quote, it's unspeakable what happened. She really had a number done on her, end quote. He praised the work of homicide detectives involved in the case and expressed confidence that police would find his sister's killer. Quote, She was gregarious to the point of being extroverted. She needed to be around people, and her job satisfied that need, John explained. An overflow crowd of 250 people attended her funeral service at St. Mary's South Hill Anglican Church on East 50th. A wake was held at the Mardi Gras nightclub at the Century Plaza Hotel, where Lynn had worked as a waitress for five and a half years. A friend and colleague, Lisa Hansen, noted, quote, she was the only waitress who outsold me. There probably wasn't a waitress in the world who sold more Dom, Dom Perignon, champagne, and when someone tried to buy her a drink, it had to be Dom, end quote. She sounds really cool. And she does, yeah. You know, I, I actually, I love vivacious, outgoing, well-traveled women like her, and, and I don't know if this is true, but... I bet she had a lot of gay friends. She seems she seems like the type of gal that a lot of gay guys love to hang out with. Well, one of the last places she went was Celebrities Nightclub, so Okay. You know. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> she's 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 my type of gal. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I totally would have hung out with her. For the five years before her death, Lynn Breeden was a cocktail waitress at Vancouver's number five orange strip club. The number five orange, also known as the number five is the Vancouver Institution and one of the only remaining strip clubs in the city. It is almost guaranteed that your dad has a few stories about some wild nights from back in the day at the number five orange. I don't know about my dad. (laughs) Anyway, people who lived here, maybe. Over the years, number five orange has hosted several famous folks among its exotic dancers, including Pamela Lee of Baywatch fame, and Courtney Love, lead singer for the band Hole and widow of Nirvana frontman Kurt Cobain. 
It is located east of the city's famous Gastown neighborhood and a few blocks north of the notorious intersection Main and Hastings. Its website claims it is known for presenting, quote, beautiful dancers seven days a week in all nude and exotic entertainment format. Okay, so I need to know, was Courtney Love a customer dancing or performing music? She she was a she was a dancer at the yeah, she told no. us that. Yep. She told us that at a concert that we went to see. We went to see Marilyn Manson and Hole, and Hole opened for Marilyn Manson. And she, uh, excuse my French, I'm going to curse a bit because I'm quoting her. She said, I fucking love Vancouver, man. I used to dance at the Orange Number 5. That's fantastic. <laughs> yep. Wow. Yep. Wow. So, yeah, Courtney Love danced at the Number 5 Orange. <laughs> Another person that's put shoved so much life into her life. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, she's she's had a crazy life. If you look for her, you'll see her also in the movie Sid and Nancy. Mm. She actually auditioned to be Nancy Spungen, who was a Sid vicious girlfriend who he stabbed yeah. to death. But uh, she was not chosen for that role, but was allowed to stay on for a. I guess it was a bit of a a featured. Yeah. performer, but I, I can't remember if she had a line or not, but you can see her in the film. She's cool. I like Courtney Love. Yeah, me too. In 2013, the number five orange made headlines when it hired a notable chef, Stu Irving, to revamp its menu. Before this, the club was known for serving more basic white trash food like frozen fries and bland burgers. Irving brought a more gourmet approach, introducing handcrafted hot dogs, burgers, and poutine Made with a high quality local ingredient. So if you want a good poutine, go to the number five orange and look at boobs. Mmm, posh, <laughs> posh poutine. Yeah. Investigators began piecing together the timeline of Lynn Breeden's final hours. In the early hours of July 6, Lynn was seen walking on Robson Street after leaving an after hours club at 1372 Seymour. Lynn Breeden's former boyfriend, Chris Paycook, lived on Robson Street in a nearby apartment building. Paycook was well known to authorities as a local drug trafficker with a criminal history. During questioning, Paycook admitted to being with Lynn for most of the night on the Friday that she went missing. He claimed that she'd stop by his apartment where they had a few drinks, converse for a while, and eventually had sex. Afterwards, Paycook stated that they went to Celebrities Nightclub and later the After Hours Club. However, according to Paycook, Lynn began behaving inappropriately by flirting with other men throughout the evening, which angered him. He asserted that after reaching his limit with her conduct, he confronted her saying, quote, We're leaving. What's up with you? Paycook claimed he left without Lynn, making that the last time he saw her. Initially, Paycook's account made him a prime suspect in the investigator's eyes. As one officer stated, quote, he looked really good to begin with. However, after thoroughly vetting his alibi and corroborating the details of his story through other witnesses and evidence, the lead appeared to be a dead end concerning Paycook's direct involvement in Lynn's disappearance and murder. Despite hitting this roadblock, the investigators remained determined to uncover the truth, analyzing every possible angle and following any promising leads in pursuing justice for Lynn. A strange break in the case soon arose. The manager of Lynn Breeden's bank, a local Scotiabank branch, called police regarding a woman who had impersonated Lynn in an attempt to withdraw funds from her account. The manager recounted the incident for forensic files. Quote, a woman came up to the counter and asked to make a withdrawal. She signed a slip for around $4,000, which was basically the full amount Lynn had in her account. But it wasn't actually Lynn. End quote. Security footage showed the imposter glancing out the window, possibly at an accomplice standing outside, though glare from the sun obscured the identity of whoever was there. When the bank staff questioned her identity, the woman abruptly left. Investigators brought in the fraud squad to analyze the footage, hoping to identify the woman through records of known fraudsters, but this avenue did not yield any answers. Police then launched an extensive effort to find and identify the impersonator, viewing her as a potentially crucial link to Lynn's murder. 
The local newspaper published the bank's surveillance photo of the woman and asked anyone able to identify her to come forward. Within hours, an anonymous tipster identified the woman as Tanya Forrester. When questioned, Forrester admitted that a man named Chris Cruz had given her Lynn Breeden's wallet and identification, claiming that they'd been given to him by someone who had stolen them. According to court documents, quote, On July 7, 1991, Cruz gave Miss Breeden's driver's license, care card, and a bank book showing a balance of $4,682.67 to a female friend. The friend agreed for a fee of $500 from the proceeds. She would impersonate Ms. Breeden and attempt to withdraw $4,500 from the bank. That attempt was unsuccessful, and the friend ultimately told police about Cruz's instigation of her impersonation and attempted theft. End quote. Forrester and Cruz planned to drain Lynn Breeden's bank account before the theft was reported. Forrester maintained she was unaware at the time that it was a homicide victim's account she was trying to access. The key development provided investigators with critical new leads to pursue in their search for Lynn Breeden's killer. The impersonation attempt suggested a motive of financial gain and cast suspicion on Tanya Forrester and her accomplice, Chris Cruz. More after a quick break. And we're back, Matthew. What are your thoughts? So doing this episode is strange because a lot of it is kind of in my neighborhood. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. I can look out my one window and kind of see Maine and Hastings. I can see Robson Street, mm-hmm. right? I'm, I'm looking out my window right now at the condo building that, that Richards on Richards used to be. Right. Right? Like, I'm looking at it right now. Yep. And it's, it's so I'm just really getting a sense of her just moving around, being young and free in this city, right? Yeah. And she was young. She's having a good time. And it, she's no different than most of us. No. She didn't have the opportunity to grow old and remember these fun times and maybe tell her grandkids about it, right? Mm-hmm. And for what? For someone who wanted to get $4,000? Yeah. You know? That's terrible. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, you can just see her living life here. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, she was doing nothing wrong. Nope. Nope. Just having fun. Yep. Chris Cruz was an unusual character. He was a model, actor, and student at the University of British Columbia, where he planned to attend medical school. Cruz led a double life, though. Along with his educational aspirations, he also went by the stage name Tony Devins, which he used as a stripper and professional male escort. Reports indicated he had a healthy appetite for cocaine. When questioned by police, Cruz admitted he was out the night of Lynn Breeden's murder, first at the Love Affair nightclub, and later at the same after-hours club that Lynn Breeden and her boyfriend had attended. A bit of an aside here, we used to call Love Affair, Love Your Hair. <laughs> oh, did, did, you, did you go? I've, I've been at Love Affair, yeah, totally. It's such a weird name for a club. Yeah. Uh, Cruz claimed he only stayed at the club for 20 minutes before leaving in a taxi to visit his girlfriend. And the next day, he said a friend offered him the contents of Lynn Breeden's purse, telling Cruz that it had been stolen. Oh, that old chestnut. Yeah. Somebody gave me it, the purse. It's somebody else's. It's like whenever the police discover cocaine in somebody's pants, they're like, well, these aren't my pants. Yeah, so some, so somebody who worked hard to steal her purse and just gave him all the contents. Exactly. Like, that's really believable. Yeah, it makes sense. When police asked to search Cruz's gray Oldsmobile, he lied about its location, claiming it was at his grandmother's place in Surrey because it wasn't running well. However, police knew he'd driven it to headquarters and parked it nearby. Unbeknownst to Cruz, he had been under police surveillance since police learned of his possible involvement in Lynn's murder. So let me get this straight, Mike. Yeah. He drove the car to his interview at police headquarters and then lied that it wasn't running. That's correct. Oh my gosh. What an yeah. idiot. What yeah. a total moron. Yeah. Well, he probably didn't suspect that they were watching him already. Yeah, but the the gall to yeah. like to drive the the murder car. Yeah. To the police headquarters, park it, and go, oh, it's not working, it's not my grandma's. Yeah. Police experts reprocessed the bank's surveillance photo and removed the glare. 
revealing that the individual outside during Tanya Forrester's withdrawal attempt looked very much like Chris Cruz. Police looked hard at Cruz's car. It appeared he'd been living out of the vehicle. Forensics teams found blood on the exterior and even more on the interior, including in the trunk. Inside the car, they discovered bloody clothing, a photo album, a spare tire, a gas can, and a tire iron from the back seat, along with a diamond-studded bloody Playboy bunny pendant similar to the one Lynn Breeden wore. Despite this overwhelming physical evidence, police had no way to confirm the blood belonged to Lynn since her remains were too damaged for DNA testing. This created a serious issue. Without being able to match the blood to Lynn, there was a possibility that Cruz could walk free despite the mountain of circumstantial evidence tying him to the crime scene and to the victim. Solving the case hinged on finding an innovative way to analyze the blood evidence. Forensic dental expert Dr. David Sweet followed the case closely and had radical ideas about helping out. Dr. Sweet, a professor at the University of British Columbia's Faculty of Dentistry, is a renowned forensic odontologist who has been frequently called upon to help identify victims and perpetrators of violent crime. As the director of the Bureau of Legal Dentistry Laboratory at UBC, Sweet has extensive experience in using dental records and other forensic techniques to assist law enforcement and medical examiners. We mentioned him in episode 104 where we covered the Rollo family murders, and more recently in episode 301, our update on the Babes in the Woods case. Dr. Sweet has been called upon more broadly to help identify victims of other violent crimes and mass disasters, drawing on his specialized training in forensic science disciplines. He has aimed to develop a mass disaster response team for Western Canada, underscoring the important role he plays in assisting law enforcement and medical professionals in complex criminal investigations. So Dr. Sweet's another one of these incredible people that shove so much into their lives, right? So... Did you know that Her Excellency, the Governor General Michel Jean, invested Dr. Sweet as an officer of the Order of Canada back in 2008? Mm-hmm. Uh, that was for his work in forensic science and as a teacher, researcher, and consultant. This case was probably factored in there. Yeah. And then in 2014, he was recognized by the Canadian Ministry of Defense with the Canadian Forces Medallion of Distinguished Service. Mm -hmm. So he's a bit of a hero, and I think if he's still around, he should call us, because I want to give him a a knighthood of the Order of the Poutine. Right? We we need to, like, create a... Yeah, let's create the the knighthood of the Order of the Poutine. Like an award. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, we should do that. That (laughs) The Order of the Poutine knighthood. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't know about a knighthood, but, uh, you know, because we don't, I don't, I'm not that arrogant to think that I can bestow a knighthood on anybody. Dude, I'm a, I'm a queen. I can just bestow the Oh, yes, you are. Well, there you go. So we, we bestowed by the queen, Matthew. <laughs> I almost called you babe right there. There you go, babe. <laughs> How are you doing there, babe? With traditional DNA testing methods rendered useless by the incinerated state of Lynn Breeden's remains, Dr. Sweet suggested an unprecedented approach, attempting to harvest genetic material from the pulp inside her teeth to generate a DNA profile. In the Forensics Files episode on the case, Dr. Sweet went into detail about the methods used to prove the blood in Cruz's car was in fact Lynn Breeden's. So after being provided with Lynn's bones and teeth as evidence, Dr. Sweet focused mainly on the impacted wisdom teeth still embedded in her upper and lower jaw bones. He theorized that these teeth were more protected from the fire's extreme heat by being deeper within the body's core. The extracted tooth pulp and blood samples collected from Chris Cruz's car were sent to the forensics lab. Initially skeptical that any part of a tooth could be viable for DNA testing, Dr. Sweet treated the pulp with a specialized chemical cocktail that allowed the DNA to separate freely into a bundle of complex molecules. Next, the DNA strands were cut into smaller fragments, marked with a radioactive dye and subjected to gel electrophoresis, an electrical field that separates the pieces. The resulting pattern, visualized on X-ray film as an autoradiogram, resembles a barcode unique to each individual. 
comparing this DNA fingerprint from the tooth pulp and to the blood evidence found in Cruz's car trunk, jacket, and photo album revealed an undeniable match to Lynn Breeden's profile. As Dr. Sweet stated, quote, it was very clear the DNA typing profiles matched that of the victim. Armed with this forensic evidence definitively tying Cruz to the crime scene and the victim, prosecutors charged him with Lynn Breeden's murder. Witnesses told police that after Lynn Breeden's boyfriend Chris Paycook left the club following an argument, Lynn began seeking cocaine and cross paths with Chris Cruz, who it was believed provided drugs to Lynn. There was no evidence confirming that they'd known each other before that night, even though they did run in the same circles for their modeling. You know, I got to just jump in here. I actually feel for Chris a little bit. Like, well, he was a very viable suspect at one point. Yeah, and I'm like, oh, you know, I've stormed out of an argument in my day when I was mm-hmm. younger. And mm-hmm. to, like, get pissy and, like, leave your partner at a club or a bar or whatever. And would, then they turn up dead. They turn up being murdered. Like, that would be a burden to carry. Like, he must have felt so horrible. <laughs> Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. There was another woman with their party in the nightclub. That woman said that Chris Cruz and Lynn Breeden went for a pizza at about 5.30 a.m., but she didn't go with them. She said that Lynn seemed very drunk at the time, and no one saw Lynn alive after that. Police surmised that some disagreement potentially over the drugs Cruz provided then led to Lynn Breeden's tragic death. Investigators theorized that Lynn Breeden and Chris Cruz drove home that morning and their argument escalated. The disagreement obviously turned violent, and in a rage, Cruz grabbed a tire iron from the trunk and struck Lynn on the head and face, explaining the injuries found on her body. What kind of animal has an argument with someone, uh, and especially someone who is of no physical threat to him, and then pulls out a tire and then pulls out a tire iron? I was going to say, shouldn't hit a woman. You shouldn't hit anybody, right? She was no physical threat to him. As Lynn Breeden lay near death with a fractured skull, Cruz allegedly grabbed his twenty two caliber rifle and shot her three times in the head. Police surmised that Cruz then placed Lynn's body into the trunk and drove to a deserted parking lot where he dumped her body inside a garbage bin and emptied the five-gallon container of gasoline he kept in the trunk. No one reportedly saw the fire as it burned for hours shortly after daybreak on July 6, 1991. According to the fire department, had Cruz used just a bit more gasoline, Lynn's body would have been completely cremated and her identification would have been impossible for science at that time. Less than two weeks after the discovery of Lynn Breeden's remains, the Alberni Times reported Cruz's arrest and charges in her murder. The brief article read in part, quote, Christian Albert Cruz, 23, a male stripper who worked as an escort under the name Tony Devins, was arrested in Surrey Tuesday night and charged Wednesday with the second-degree murder of Mary Lynn Breeden, 30. It's been a long, hard 12 days, said Vancouver Police Detective Al Catley. Cruz's bail was denied, and he was held in custody to face trial. In November 1993, two years after Lynn Breeden's murder, 26-year-old Christian Albert Cruz was found guilty. The, pr- the prosecutor argued it was a planned and deliberate first-degree murder with Cruz killing Breeden to access her savings account. However, the jury found Cruz guilty of the lesser charge of second-degree murder, meaning the killing lacked an element of planning and deliberation. While the prosecution theorized Cruz beat Lynn unconscious, drove her to the dumpster, shot her, and set her body on fire in a planned attack, Cruz's lawyer argued much of this was speculative since the circumstances of her death were unknown. Well, one person knows. Anyway, Cruz now faced a mandatory life sentence with at least 10 years of parole ineligibility. Cruz admitted through his lawyer that he had killed Lynn Breeden, and burned her body, but did not reveal the exact circumstances surrounding her death. Well, that's quite a trick, isn't it? Mm. The circumstances of her death are unknown because the murderer refuses to say what happened, and therefore he gets a lesser charge. Right. And I can't imagine how frustrating that would be for family and friends. It had to be. It's frustrating to me now, and it's, you know, 30 years later. And, you know, I get it, right? I get it in terms of... um, if you did something you don't want to get caught, you know, you just, you don't say what happened. 
right? right. But um, that doesn't show a lot of remorse. Nope. According to court documents, when deciding Cruz's 18-year sentence, the trial judge said, The pre-sentence report and evidence from Cruz's lawyer showed he was 26 years old in good health and came from a relatively stable and supportive family background. References about his earlier years spoke positively of Cruz as a caring and considerate young man who seemed destined to become a doctor. However, two years before this crime, there was a notable downward spiral into a reckless lifestyle and increased drug use for Mr. Cruz. More recently, there were signs of remorse for the crime and a return to the religious guidance of his youth. The judge sincerely hoped this rehabilitative improvement would continue and considered those factors. Cruz had no criminal record. At the time of this crime, he was employed as a male exotic dancer with a long-term addiction to cocaine and alcohol. To fund these habits, the evidence indicated Cruz was prone to lying, cheating, and stealing even from his friends. Future rehabilitation would require substantial therapy for substance abuse and psychiatric intervention for him. By the method and way he committed this particular murder, Cruz had clearly demonstrated that he presented a high risk of danger to society. But the judge was also mindful that properly assessing Cruz's long-term danger to society was the responsibility of the parole board authorities under the National Parole Act. The aggravating circumstances of this case, however, indicated a sentence beyond the general 10-year period of parole ineligibility. Thus, it was set at 18 years. You know what gets me, though? This whole, so you found Jesus, but he hasn't told you to tell exactly what happened. Right. right? And yeah. the whole good for you, you found Jesus that, that judges do, or any other deity, right? I, to me, it shouldn't even be mentioned. That should be like a personal thing, mm-hmm. whatever. Mm-hmm. But people seem to kind of use it like it somehow, um, it somehow fixes them or shows remorse. But, you know, Jesus wasn't, did Jesus tell you to actually be 100% forthcoming? If you were actually talking to Jesus, he would have, and you didn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, frankly, right? Yes, exactly. Because Jesus was a cool dude, and he would have told him to do the right thing. <laughs> he Maybe. Would have. He uh, would have. 100% he would have. Yeah. Lynn Breeden's obituary in the Vancouver Sun was short and pointed. Quote, in memory of Lynn Breeden, December 18, 1960, to July 6, 1991. To the living, I am gone. To the sorrowful, I will never return. To the angry, I was cheated. But to the happy, I am at peace. And to the faithful, I never left. Love, mom and brothers. End quote. Lynn's father, Captain Ronald Breeden, former RCAF pilot, passed away in August 2018 in Campbell River, B.C. at the age of 86. It's unknown what has become of Christian Albert Cruz, but his mandatory minimum sentence expired 15 years ago. He likely walks among us. And that's it for Dark Poutine, episode 320, All That Remains, The Murder of Mary Lynn Breeden. That's right. It's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at one 327 5786 or one 827 darkptn We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. Great. I guess it's time for voicemails. Matthew, are you ready for to listen to some listeners? I am. Okay, let's listen to our first one. Hi, this is Marion Kahn again from Jackson Heights, Queens. Yeah, I've called before. I just finished listening to episode 307, three on the track, and you said that the area was, you know, used as for trade traffic, um, drug traffic, I mean. I wonder if the cops were involved in the drug, drug trafficking. Like, cops would never, ever do such a thing or cover up. I'm not saying they were. But perhaps that's an element or, uh, you know, that, that was involved and that's why no answers. Anyway, still love your podcast and the birds and the cats and the dogs say hello. And I love to see. Love to see. Bye. Uh, uh-huh. Thank you, Marion. 
Thank you, Marion. I wonder if Marion Kahn is related to Madeline Kahn. The last name is spelled different, but... <laughs> She's and, from Jackson Heights. Yeah, and we'll we'll do an early Donut Money, Donut, donut Money shout out for her because she sent us some donut money. She Yay. says, love your show, enjoy the donuts, cat the dog, and my seven cats, and Steve virtual dog bone. And obviously, she has birds, too. <laughs> no, I, I, She's a very animal-focused person, but I'm good with that. Yeah. I, I grew up with a vet as a dad, so. I like Marianne. She sounds cool. <laughs> yeah, she really, she really does. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marianne. Yeah, much appreciated. What does Marianne uh, do for a living there in... Uh, where she is in Jackson Heights, Queens. Yes, yeah. yeah. I think she's the queen of queens. She's the queen of queens. Yeah, she just walks down the street. She knows everybody. She talks to them, and uh, people just generally come to her for advice. Yep. Yeah. Sounds great. Yep. Let's listen to another. <laughs> one. Well, thank you, Marion, so much. Much appreciated. And let's listen to another one. Hi, Mike and Matthew and Steve, of course. My name's Avery. I'm from uh, Bray Creek, Alberta, just outside of Calgary, um, close to the beautiful Rocky Mountains. Anyway, um, I've wanted to call many a times. I've been a, a, a li listener for a very long time. Um, but your episode about uh, Bill Miner really instigated the, the me calling because I worked at the keg for seven years as a server it got me through my undergrad and master's and um the worst shift of my life was the night <laughs> we ran out of billy minor pie because people absolutely love billy minor pie so uh matt you're gonna need to go try it because it is scrumptious um yeah anyway i thank you all for everything that you do um as someone who's had you know, close contact with, um, you know, death, homicide, and challenging situations, and working as a therapist and hearing the traumas of people's lives. Um, I just really appreciate the uh, the outlook that you bring and the support you have for those left behind, and uh, that the impact is not just on the 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 ones who pass. And um, yeah, keep up all the great work and go take a Duke and your Duke. Okay. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I really like Avery as a name. Yeah, me do too. You wanna, do you want to hear something cool? Sure. Avery might not even know this. So so it's traditionally a guy's name, but, mm -hmm. you know, it changed over time. Yep. It's, it's ultimately derived from the old English name Alfred, which was Alfred. Sure. Which is formed of the elements elf, which is elf, and raid, which is council. So her name stems from a word that literally means elf council. That's very cool. Yeah. <laughs> so she's an elf counselor. There you, so and, she talked about being a therapist, so she's yeah, a therapist to the for, elves. <laughs> a, a, a therapist for elves. In, <laughs> uh, did she say, what's the name of the place? Bright Creek? Bragg, Bragg Creek. Oh, yeah. Bragg Creek. Yeah. Well, why why say you're bragging about it? Just call it Bright, because that's the actual Bragg. Sure. It's a Bright Creek. There you go. <laughs> you're like Matthew. You're going on a tangent. Yeah, he's he's lost the plot. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Avery. Much Thanks, appreciated. Avery. Uh, we've got a few voicemails this week, so let's listen to another. Are they all nice? Hey, gentlemen, it's Justin here over at Kamloops. I'm about to play some Grand Theft Equine, and there's a mission in there that reminds me of Billy Miner. I went on a Billy Miner train ride a few years ago, and it was sure as heck fun. I'm wondering if y'all are going to cover the uh, BC Triangle some cowboys are missing. Go poop in your tukes, and have a great day. Yeehaw! <laughs> <laughs> Grand Theft Equine. He's playing some uh, Red Dead Redemption, or as uh, I mentioned, my friend's kid calls it Red Dead Horsey. <laughs> Red Dead Horsey. Uh, people yeah. it really resonated with that episode, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, for I sure. Love it. I love it when people put on voices when they call in as well. Yeah, but you don't love it when I do, which is weird. I don't, I don't, understand. I don't understand, Matthew, why you are not into looking into the abyss because the abyss looks back at you. That's your one good fake accent. Well, I can do Hank Hill. 
I like propane and propane accessories. You know, <laughs> it's one of those things. There's those two kids whacking off in the tool shed again like a couple of spider monkeys. <laughs> Did you just make that line up now? No, no. It was it was from uh, I think Beavis and Butthead. But <laughs> anyway, it's fun. Uh, yeah. So, well, thank you for calling about the Red Dead Redemption. That was really good up there in Kamloops. The Loops. I need to go visit Kamloops now. I have so many friends there. I got Jason Hewlett, when, who I went to shoot documentary with. I have. Uh, my friend Tim Conrad, who I went to high school with and met him in the uh, in the airport in Edmonton. And I've got other friends up there, too. So I guess it's going to be a trip to Kamloops at some point this summer. Has uh, Kamloops been getting uh, particularly murdery lately? It's it's not a... it's It's got some crime going on there, but, you know... Because I saw some stuff, you know, I only read my elevator news. Sure. And there was like, I, I think it was, I think they said Kamloops. Yeah, I wouldn't doubt it. You know, when I was a kid and used to listen to CBC radio. Yep. I always would like smile because I thought Kamloops was such a funny name for a town. Yeah. So I'd always wait for the weather forecast when they talk, when they said Kamloops. I'm like, yay! Kamloops. Not, <laughs> not, not never having been to BC or even knowing what it was. Yeah. I like Kamloops. Kamloops yeah. is a good place. Good little town. All righty, uh, we have one more voicemail. I'm Mike and Matthew. It's Chris calling from British Columbia. Um, I've been listening to your podcast for quite a while. I find it very entertaining. Of course, uh, Canadian content is big for me. Um, I've recently retired, and I'd like uh, Matthew to figure out what I retired from. <laughs> and uh, just, uh, although I've never had to shit in a hat uh, <laughs> had to puke in a toque so <laughs> keep up the great work and um i was uh i normally skip past the um ends and beginnings that's just time sensitive stuff for me um but i was uh i was quite disappointed <laughs> when i was listening and you guys don't say that you're canadian schmucks anymore <laughs> which i thought was pretty funny mm. anyway have a great day. Keep up the good work. And you can keep mine for one of those days when you don't have a voicemail, which, again, it sounds sad in your voice when you say, oh, there's no voicemail. <laughs> and I don't say, we don't say schmucks anymore because a, a Yiddish friend of mine gave me some feedback about it and said, you guys aren't schmucks. Schmucks are, are like not good people. So <laughs> we're so, schmucks. We're schmoes, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> You're a schmuck. But yeah, so that's why we don't say schmuck anymore. I do but, I I do know what he I I do know what Chris uh retired from. Okay, what did Chris retire from? I'm very curious about that. Well he gave us a little hint when he talked about the importance of CanCon, Canadian content. Okay. All right. So Chris was the guy at the CRTC that had the ultimate say in the maple on the back of albums. Remember M A P L? Yes. Music, artist, performance, and lyrics. You had to like have three out of the four be, to be considered Canadian Right, content. and they were circled. Yeah. So yeah. He, he was the maple guy. Oh, so he did the circling. Yeah. No, he, <laughs> he, he, he sanctioned if it was truly Canadian content. So for American listeners who don't know this, so uh, back when it was just radio and television, there was a rule of a certain percentage of Canadian content. 60%. Be yeah. Because a lot of stuff came from the South. And it's, it's like trying to tamp down a really loud neighbor. Yeah. By, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To play your own music. And, uh, but you had to have a little, a maple thing on your album and you had to have three or the four to get into the Canadian content rotation. There you go. This is also why shows like Bowling for Dollars was famous because they needed Canadian content. So they just videotaped people bowling for money. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank dear. you for, thank you for calling, Chris. Thank you for all your voicemails. Much appreciated. That's it for this week's voicemails. Again, you can leave us one at 1-877-327-5786 or 1877 darkptn We'd love to hear from you, even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats. If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. Alrighty, let's move on to 
patrons and Donut Money donors. We do have a patron this week, and that person's name is Mark Simas. And if I'm pronouncing it correct, it's S-I-M-A-S. Could be Simas, but I think it's Simas. Um, where, where does Mark live, first of all, Matthew? And what does Mark do? Mark lives in Kamloops. Okay, back in Kamloops. Yeah, he, he, in, he's in Kamloops, and he's a, he's a forensic... Um, you know how we're talking about the... on What do you call it? On... Dentist today. What, 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 what's doctor? What's doctor? Odontology. Sweet? Odontology. Yes. Mark is a forensic tailor. Okay. Yeah. Mm, forensic tailors. That that would have been useful in uh, a bunch of different cases. For example, the uh, Somerton man, because they yeah. were trying to figure out where he was from, and the clothing had no labels. Yeah. So Mark actually is a specialist, and he can he can like figure out very quickly just from clothes exactly where they were bought and where they're from, where they were manufactured. That's very cool. That is very very cool. Let's keep up the good work, Mark. Keep up the good work. And thank and, you for your patronage. Yes, much Patri- appreciated. Patreonage. Patreonage. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate it. Um, we also have uh, some donut money donors. We've already mentioned Marion R. Khan. Marion Khan, Queen of Queens. Yes, the Queen of Queens. We also have Hazel Rhodes Claire. Okay. And she says, all the pleasure I get from listening to your podcasts. So that that's the reason she sent us some donut money. So thank you. Hazel, what does where does she live and what does she do? First of all, that's another great name, Hazel. Um, Hazel so is a good name. Hazel Rhodes is from Rhode Island, and and she mm. she actually is the uh, founder of the Rhodes Scholarship. Oh, interesting. Not, not Rhodes. That it, even though talks. it's spelled differently, <laughs> it's spelled different. It's her own scholarship. Oh, I gotcha. Yeah, and it's an art scholarship. Arts. Yeah, yeah, there needs to be more scholarships for the arts. I mean, yeah. we've yeah. we've like maybe maybe some apprenticeships, scholarships for apprenticeships too. We need people to build things. Hazel Rhodes is sort of like an artist name as well. Hazel Rhodes, you can you, yes. you can totally see her being an, an artist. Hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. Next we have Cynthia Lee Pawlowski. And mm-hmm. she says, I've been listening and enjoying Dark Poutine, listening to and enjoying Dark Poutine for many years now. Thank you for doing all the hard work that goes into the show. Much appreciated. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, where is she from? And what does she do, <laughs> Matthew? He's just staring at me like blankly. She's from the, she's from, what do we call it now? Not the Queen Charlotte Islands. Um, the H- Haida Gwaii. Haida Gwaii, okay. Haida Gwaii, and with a last name like Pawlowski. Yes. She owns a pet grooming studio. She owns a pet grooming studio in Haida Gwaii, and does she specialize? Pawlowski's Paws. Okay. Does she, she specialize in any particular she animals? She, she she does. No, she she specializes in their nails, and oh. not, not clipping them, but painting them. Little I'm thinking, painted nails. Yeah, I'm thinking about taking Steve up there, and she's going to put like little diamantes on his nails. Oh, that's very nice. Steve, <laughs> Steve would then proceed to be done with those things. Paulowski's paws in Haida Gwaii. There you go. There you folks. go. Look it up. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I thank forgot. You. I forgot the name of, of. I forgot the contemporary name for the islands. Excuse oh, well. me. Yeah. All righty. Well, thank you so much. To all our patrons and Donut Money donors, appreciate you so much. We do. Thanks to all our patrons and Donut Money donors, past and present, for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash darkpoutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us Donut Money via PayPal using our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. If you haven't gotten yours yet, my book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, is available to order via a link on the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of darkpoutine.com, please check it out for show notes and other cool stuff. We'd appreciate it if you took the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening, and tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing.
And that's it for this episode of Dark Poutine. So until next time, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Because there's enough of those already. There's enough bad apples. We learned about one today. Signing off from the two schmucks here in British Columbia. <laughs> Schmoes, schlubs, <laughs> nebishes, you name it. <laughs>